Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I am Xavier Solomon. I'm the Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator here at the Frick. And welcome to this conversation with Darren Waterston. And I'm very excited to introduce Darren and um, have a chat with him in a minute. But the, just to explain how the hour is structured, Darren will start by um, talking about uh, the topic of the day, about his relationship with works here at the Frick and other works in general and about his practice. And then the two of us will be in conversation for a bit and then we'll open um, up for questions from the floor. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Darren Waterston. Uh, hello, and um, thank you, Xavier. I first of all want to um, just express again what an extraordinary honor this is to um, be at the Frick to give a talk. It's like, what? Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, I want to thank Xavier um, for inviting me to participate in this, um, in this uh, talk today uh, in, the, in a series of lectures here at the, at the Frick. Um, I want to quickly thank uh, Persephone here at the Frick who's helped so much in all the logistics of pulling this together and a special thank you to Nicole Miller, a uh, dear friend and manager and runs my studio who's helped um, uh, greatly in the, in the presentation and helping me prepare. So as a, as a living artist who actually gets to discuss his um, art practice uh, in the context of the Frick, I mean, you can imagine it's like, it's an extraordinary thing. And particularly to be able to talk about um, uh, the um, Bellini's uh, masterwork um, to sort of begin the conversation uh, is also kind of an extraordinary thing because um, this is like the one singular painting in my life that really put me on a trajectory as an artist. And um, you know, I think every artist has this sort of aha moment um, whether you're a visual artist, a painter like myself, or a musician with a work, um, a composed you know, work of art. But in the case of a painter, um, there are those moments or that's one object that are so transformative and that kind of change the course of how you see things and maybe in a certain way embolden you with this pursuit of the artist that always seems so troubling and and difficult to even begin and to think, oh yeah, like living a life that in, in pursuit of making art is actually a meaningful life. And I think this one painting really did that for me when I was a young art student uh, at Otis Parsons and I was maybe 22 years old and I, I um, was told to come to the Frick from a, uh, an art history professor I had, and it was maybe only my second time ever coming to New York from the West Coast. And so I made my way here to the Frick and came to see this painting, which I'd only seen in the art history class, and I was very, very interested in finding out more about it, came here, and I really did have this moment where it was just this sort of visceral, emotional moment seeing this painting, just like everything changed. I was like, oh my God, okay, wait. How, how do I begin to even interact with the painting? How do, I, how do I make sense of the effect the painting is having on me? How do I rationalize something like this inanimate object in the world that can be so transmittive and, and so transformative? Um, so I, again, to be able to like, if you can imagine just like after all of this time and coming to see this painting, um, actually every year of my life since that, uh, I was living on the West Coast the whole time, but um, I've managed to see this painting uh, every year of my life since that moment, you know, when I was a young student. And um, I moved to New York eight years ago, and the two reasons were I thought, well, I get to be closer to my boyfriend, which is great, and I get to be closer to the St. Francis in the Wilderness painting, that was really like one of the first things that, that came to mind. I was like, oh yeah, well now I can like go there all the time. And um, so it, again, um, this, uh, this, this painting, um, I'm sure all of you have some relationship with this, this work. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the great masterpieces of the Frick collection and it depicts 
um, Francis of Assisi, uh, the medieval Christian saint, standing alone on a rocky molten outcrop, his stance open, hands open, jaw open, and he appears to be in an altered state of consciousness. And this painting cam captures the saint in this transcendental moment, and Saint Francis, now he becomes this sort of forever unmoving signifier. Like, I keep on thinking, like, Bellini has made, made it so, so like, he locked him into this perpetual state of ecstasy and wonder. Like, he's just kind of like, for, for the rest of time, you know? Like, Bellini has made it so that he could never come out of this trance. And I wonder, like, I keep on thinking, like, well, would he want to come out of it? And if he tried, could he? And instead, it's like Bellini has suspended him in oil and pigment for, like, the rest of time, just with his jaw agape. And there's something so profound about that, so haunting about that. And, um, and for me, one of the most moving and unsettling depictions of, of this uh, figure and saint. Um, and um, Bellini was a very devout Catholic, very pious artist, and came from a long tradition and family history around painting um, ecclesiastical and religious subject matter. So I always think that Bellini must have just thought, okay, yeah, like God is in the details, definitely, because <laughs> uh, let alone just looking at the representation of St. Francis, he is, he's occupying this extraordinary, um, this extraordinary landscape that is filled with very, very detailed flora and fauna. And, um, and it just, in so many ways, I feel like the, la the landscape itself has a big job to do in that it actually kind of holds the psychological state of St. Francis. It sort of represents in many ways an interiority. And, and I, I always sort of, every time I come to this, I feel as if the, the external world and the kind of physicality of the world that St. Francis is inhabiting in this painter is very interior and that in some way um, represents uh, and has to kind of hold the weight of his interior experience. Um, so in this presentation, I, I've chosen um, to use this Bellini masterwork uh, as a point of departure to look at four persistent themes in my own work. Saint, terrain, spirit, beast, um, and then I'd like to end with a brief overview of two large-scale projects of mine, um, one titled Filthy Lucre and the second, um, a project in, in, um, in, that I'm working on right now called The Congregation of Tears. Um, they're both immersive installations um, interrogating many of the same topics of the Bellini painting. Um, I just wanted to show you quickly this, this beautiful detail. And of course, after the talk, um, you'll have some time to be with the painting, which is in itself a whole other experience, of course. Um, this is a, a watercolor um, titled St. Francis Becoming Tree. Um, that's a recent work, in, work on paper um, where you can see the, a direct reference um, taken from Bellini. I did um, a series of these uh, works on paper with the theme of, of uh, kind of bodily form um, mutating uh, into uh, a plant or uh, organic form. So here I, I chose to paint the saint uh, in silhouette and in the state of metamorphosis um, and also sort of occupying this destabilized dreamy landscape that it was very much a reference to um, the Bellini painting. Um, this is a, a painting titled The Hermit's Paradise. Um, and so as we're, as I'm sort of bringing this together to discuss saints, um, I, uh, I always think of the saint too as, as the hermit, the recluse. And here um, is a work that um, sort of plays with this um, play between sort of disquiet and beauty, which is often a theme in my work. And 
Um, this, this piece depicts this sort of utopian vision of remoteness and isolation, and not unlike the um, landscape that St. Francis inhabits, it's, there's hiding places, there's caves and crevices, and it's this floating island of sorts in suspension. Um, but it's a, a utopian vision that perhaps in some way has gone awry. Um, but um, you'll notice the reference to Bellini in some parts of this around the actual um, gestures of the uh, topography. Uh, this is a work on paper called Tree Worshippers, and it's a depiction, once again, of sort of ecstasy and devotion, um, where the natural world is perceived through these hallucinogenic op optics. Um, this, again, really does stem back from my interest in St. Francis, who would go on these, um, these long um, solo um, very isolated retreats, and he would subjugate his body and put his body through these extreme um, conditions to where he would be either dehydrated or um, physically, you know, physically very weak. And I always imagined, you know, what would be the optics of that and the kind of physiological state of mind that when your body is so brought to such an extreme in hopes for some opening of a mystical event or some epiphany, that there has to be a kind of um, an optical response to that. St. Francis also had um, documented in the early, um, uh, very earliest uh, writings of his life, um, he had what was a weeping eye. So of course there's all the metaphor around this, but he really did have this uh, congenitive eye um, uh, condition where he really saw the world through this like veil of tears and it's such a kind of poetic you know thing to contemplate and um, and so I have kind of always used that and certainly the motif of the the emotive eye has sort of been an ongoing theme in my work for a long time um, so this really is about the sort of almost transgressive potential of both the natural and imaginary worlds. And it's hard to see, but the, um, the figures below, there are two figures and their arms are open and extended and their hands are turning into branches. Um, it, on the relationship again with um, saints and St. Francis, uh, in 2006 I was granted an artist residency just outside of Assisi where I immerse myself in all things Franciscan, um, history, mythology, and the actual location. Um, being able to s study in the actual landscape and sites where the Franciscan narrative takes place. So S. St. Francis is roughly 1180 it was when he was born, um, and he died in 1226, 1225, 1226, something like that. Um, and so I was just, I completely had this amazing opportunity to work um, in this residency. And over that time there, I developed over 200 uh, drawings and watercolors that were the premise um, for an additioned print portfolio uh, titled The Flowering, which was based on the little flowers of St. Francis um, or the Fioretti, which is one of the early um, canons of, uh, of Franciscan thought. and um, Fioretti in Italian uh, also means um, blossoms or uh, little blossoms or little petals of wisdom. But Fioretti also means small cuts or abrasions or wounds, which is um, kind of perfect for St. Francis. And um, so here um, the images I chose, uh, one is of uh, the receiving of the stigmata and the other is um, of this uh, motif of the pink cloud, which comes often into Franciscan imagery. Giotto almost exclusively always represented St. Francis in this kind of strange cloud of pink that he would hover in. Um, there's also a seraphim, which is uh, another very um, uh, important uh, 
iconic image in the Franciscan mythology and that he receives the stigmata from the seraphim. Um, so um, this, the piece on the right, you know, shows the kind of white chalky rocks of Averna and the pink cloud. And, um, and again, it's, it's about the sort of transmissions, um, transmissions of stigmata and um, it was a wonderful project and a wonderful residency to have. So, uh, yeah, so I love a saint. Um, I love all the, like, I mean, if you're an artist and you're engaged in European history, you'd be like, you, you have to know your saints. So I always think, like, like uh, rule one, like, a saint must suffer, right? They have to be, like, flayed, they have to have their head cut off, or their eyes taken out, or they have to be, like, jabbed with, like, Seraphim's like shooting down stuff to you like, and you just always have to go through something. Um, and then rule two, two is that they have to, you know, to be canonized, canonized. You don't always have to be martyred, but it's kind of good if you are, but you don't have to. And then the th rule three is you have to perform two um, miracles. So it's like, it's a lot to do. Um, and in this case, I just, uh, I did a series of works on paper and paintings a few years ago that were just taking the saints and trying to sort of reduce um, particular attributes to that saint down to the most kind of elemental um, motifs. And in this case, it's a faceless head of St. John um, that's just comprised of his hair and beard. And there's kind of a ghost of a, a sort of disc or platter um, representing his fate. Uh, the next uh, topic in in um, in contemplation here is terrain. Um, this is a painting titled Berg um, from last year. Um, so, as a painter of pictorial space, I have always held an unwavering interest in the early history of landscape painting and its origins as an independent genre. So Bellini's St. Francis in the Wilderness is just a perfect example where the particularities of the landscape hold both physical and psychological space, and they do much of the work to express the interior experience through external phenomena. Um, this is what I often set out to do in my own work when I approach a painting um, through the formal structures of landscape. Uh, sometimes I explore the allure and menace both of an idealized landscape that has been destabilized in some way. Um, this is another painting from last year um, that was uh, part of an exhibition I had um, this spring at DC Moore Gallery where I'm represented here in New York and the exhibition was called Ecstatic Landscape. Um, this piece is titled Abundance and, um, and oftentimes when I'm approaching pictorial work like this it can kind of shift again from the idealized to the dystopic and often sort of contain both of those, um, uh, you know, both of those qualities at the same time. So here in this painting, um, Abundance, there's this kind of large, looming, biomorphic, undulating form that's almost Nautilus, Nautilus-like, uh, and it imposes itself on this very traditional uh, Bellini-esque landscape. Um, this piece is, is entitled Inversion Landscape Number One. This is just a detail of it. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot in this piece that I really must give as a great homage to um, St. Francis in the Wilderness in that um, there is this, um, once again, the sort of molten, strange, destabilized landscape of Bellini's um, painting and um, and I title this inversion landscape because inversion is really a, a reversal or a rejection of the normal order and the normal order of things. And there's something again in, in, in the Bellini landscape that is so, um, it seems as if everything is in its rightful place, but it's also, it's a very strange and kind of unstable space. So um, in this case, I did again have a little hint to St. Francis with this strange pink cloud and uh, and thinking about retreat and isolation, there's almost these ruins of Gothic arches, and and um, you know it's again sort of 
uh, set out to be uh, beautiful and, and also somewhat haunting. Uh, this is a painting uh, from the beginning of this year. It was completed. It's quite large. It's about eight by six feet. It's titled uh, Outlook. And once again, looking at themes of remoteness. And it's sort of, it's both sort of terrestrial and cosmological. And, you know, I've been wanting to sort of play with this idea of sort of shuttling between earthly realms, heavenly realms. And um, I intentionally used a very representational strategy with this um, to play out the artifice of pictorial space. You know, pictorial space is just this, you know, it's this created thing on a two-dimensional surface. And we come to a painting with so much expectation and sort of demand that in some way um, the surface, at what point does it shift and become something else other than paint? And I think the representation of pictorial space is often that kind of leap of, as the viewer, we're always sort of, we sort of demand this sometimes of a, of a pictorial work. And that, um, and so I was playing with that on this piece and yet at the same time wanted to sort of fracture and disrupt um, the pictorial space. Um, this is from the same body of work and also uh, quite large, eight by six feet, titled The Ascetics Retreat. Um, so I often explore mythological, theological, and natural histories while uh, proposing visual depictions of the ineffable in some way. And uh, here, um, there's some evidence of human life. Um, there are fragments of this very strange sort of organic Gothic cathedral room ruin that that merges from this seemingly impossible rock formation. Um, and the scene is supposed to evoke a place of refuge and at the same time um, both sort of Edenistic and dystopian. Um, I chose this piece to show you, just it's titled Terrain, um, uh, just because I wanted to speak just a little bit about the painterly concept sfumato, which is an Italian word uh, used in describing um, uh, a, a painting technique that is that allows sort of tones and colors and shade and value to gradually move back and in, uh, move into each other and then be able to produce these sort of softened outlines and hazy forms. Um, the word in Italian is also smoke. And what's interesting about though with Sumato and the, the um, Bellini painting is that he actually doesn't use this device. His lines are so crisp and so perfectly delineated even when he's going way, way back into the distant um, projection of the space. He keeps the details still so, there's not the, the blur. If you, if you look at it, it's, it has this incredible descriptive um, um, quality on every layer as it progressively goes back into space, and it's really qu quite astounding. Um, so um, the other thing I often think about, and I did so just again the, this morning standing in front of the Bellini painting, is like, what is your vantage point? Like, are we hovering? Are we grounded? Are we on? Are we like on the ground? Are our feet on the ground? Are we kind of floating about? And so I think about that as well when I'm um, setting out to create um, a space not unlike this one. Uh, this is a painting called To Altdorfer. Um, since I am a, a contemporary artist who continues to find myself so immersed in art history, particularly that of the Renaissance, Northern Renaissance even more so, um, this is uh, one of many sort of small homages in my, in my life to uh, uh, Albrecht Altdorfer, who was a great, um, uh, a, a great uh, Netherlandish uh, painter, um, and he um, is, you know, kind of the, the lead of the Flemish primitives, and he is also kind of the, I mean, he's one of my great heroes, and he's also the father of landscape as an independent genre. He sort of established that first. Uh, and he was also one of the um, uh, first in the Northern Renaissance to use oil painting, uh, to use oil paint materials, which is also one of Bellini's great contributions among everything else. But Bellini was also 
one of the early forefront uh, uh, art artists of the Italian Renaissance who is making this transition from tempera into, uh, into oil. Um, this piece is not upside down. Um, this is actually <laughs> how it was conceived. Um, but it's about a five foot square painting uh, titled Arcadia. And again, it's sort of taking these idealized, uh, idealized landscapes and in this case, literally turning it upside down. Um, and uh, one of the last images in this series under terrain is this painting called Prospect. Um, another nod to Bellini, where in this case the sky really becomes the subject and field of contemplation. And very quietly and very subtly, the surface is also marred by small little painterly cuts and abrasions and wounds and maybe even stigmata. But they're very small and they're sort of hovering throughout the um, space of the sky. Um, so uh, the last image that I just showed you kind of leads us into this next um, um, topic of spirit. Um, and for me, spirit is really less about a kind of, um, you know, religious um, um, reference and more about disembodiment. And so it's, you know, yes, it, it is inclusive of the I idea, the c concept of soul or spirit, but it's about consciousness that lacks uh, a physical form. And so I'm always thinking like, how do I depict the ineffable? How do we represent the invisible? How, um, how do artists, you know, uh, long before Bellini, you know, have all always been sort of in the quest of how to, um, how to give form to the formless, formlessness things and these concepts. And so, um, the pieces I wanted to show you are kind of in relationship to disembodiment in some way. This is uh, titled Tree of Life. Um, it's quite a corporeal, figurative conglomerate um, that's constructed of both natural and unnatural detritus. So here sort of branches become limbs, roots become arteries, as bones and fronds and these sort of whimsical gestures that are play between matter and spirit. Um, this is a um, part of a series that I created in 2014 that was sort of uh, very sculptural in nature. And I took um, and had these panels built based on uh, particular ecclesiastical objects and forms uh, such as conf confessional partitions altars and devotional objects. Um, this piece uh, is closely based on um, Matthias Grunewald's 16th century masterpiece, The Eisenheim Altar, one of my other great, great works of art uh, that are um, life-changing for me. Um, so this triptych is a, a polyptic structure. So it all, it's hinged and it actually had another interior layer of of uh, side wings that were um, separate from this main piece. And it was built to, exact state, to the exact scale of Grunewald's altar, inclusive of the predella, which is the horizontal piece below. So these hinged panels um, are flayed open and, um, and inviting the viewer in for you know, closer examination. Um, whoops. All right, so I just, I had to include could not help but include um, Jean Barbet's gorgeous angel that um, you can see in the um, the garden courtyard here. I again, this this piece to me is just one of the great. Um, this is like the guardian angel of the Frick. Um, so um, I know I just find this piece so it's so sinuous and arresting and feels somewhat dangerous. And it's just there's something about those wings that are they're just razor sharp and there's kind of this both grace and, and violence to them that I, I just find so compelling. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so I chose just to uh, juxtapose it with a detail of a large painting um, of mine that is titled Flight. And 
um, is about, again, this disembodiment. And here is, you know, here were these wings that I remember um, years ago coming here and sketching the wings of the Barbet. And, um, and they found themselves years later in this large painting um, from 2009. That's, yeah. Um, here's another piece uh, that is part of the series of the uh, architectonic forms that uh, became paintings. This is a double-sided screen, and so there's a whole other painting, much more sort of landscape-oriented on the backside. And um, this is quite large. I think it's maybe eight and a half feet tall. And I had this um, form built for me, um, and then um, and then I painted on both sides. And it's again this kind of rather imposing form that's um, you know has a, a sort of religious in nature, but also um, uh, sort of uh, uh, is it uh, like a her like a herald, right? Like a um, like a shield in a certain way. And in the center of it is um, a sort of gesture that, again, is both figurative and bodily, um, that is uh, a sort of descriptive in a certain way um, around spirit. Um, and then I wanted to just show you this uh, juxtaposition because, first of all, I, Dürer is, again, one of my great heroes. And um, this is a piece from the Frick collection that's quite beautiful, a coat of arms with skull. Um, which is about from 1504. And, um, and it's next to uh, a work on paper of mine called Transgressions, which is from this year. And, um, and I, just, I chose to juxtapose these two just in order to, first of all, speak a little bit about Dürer and who is like, if I was like canonizing saints, Dürer would definitely be one of mine. He didn't even have to martyr himself. But um, so here in Dürer's piece, we have this uh, heraldic device or emblem that's serving as a symbolic representation to the themes of desire and folly. And it's a bit of a memento mori with the skull. And my piece is also this um, kind of strange juxtaposition of figurative and organic in sort of some tangled uh, um, formation. Um, Dürer visited Venice in 1506, um, just a couple of years after he did this piece. And he described uh, Bellini as still the best painter in the city. And he said he was full of all courtesy and generosity towards foreign brethren of the brush, <laughs> which I love. Uh, the, the last uh, topic in the four um, around the Bellini is um, beast. So of course in Bellini's painting that is filled with all these marvelous and kind of unsuspected um, portrayals of the hare, the, um, the contemplative donkey that is so prominent in the piece. And, um, and so um, I, I use um, animal mo motifs to represent states of being and becoming, metamorphosis, dematerialization, and sometimes even decay. My animals appear either highly rendered or barely evoked. So like my landscapes, they're in a constant state of flux. And the materi materiality of the animal's bodies is always kind of marking this paradox between concrete existence and their kind of unstable they're sort of occup occupying this unstable time, time and space. Um, this is from a series of paintings called Split the Lark um, that was based on an Emily Dickinson poem with the same title. Um, here's my celestial lion, which I really like him. Uh, this is another large painting from about six years ago or so. And it's just titled Leo. Um, and often the animals in my paintings, they um, may become victims of the atmospheric upheaval that surrounds them, um, or sometimes they just may be products of it in this case, but they're never separated. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, here, um, I just wanted to bring these two pieces together because I really love the juxtaposition. First of all, there's this 
extraordinary automated or automaton uh, lion clock here in the collection. Xavier, someday, can I see this thing in motion? Because I would just like, this thing is incredible. <laughs> um, the uh, clock is uh, from 1640 by Christoph Miller. It's a very, very beautiful object. And, um, and I wanted to show it in relation to a piece titled Hypertrophy Skulls that I did a few years back. Um, so this is, you know, whether monstrous, fanciful, or abstract, the animals I use merge into composites often. And this is a composited form where um, this works as sort of a memento mori of sorts again. And I think of it as sort of this decadent meditation on the passage of time, and it's all made with gilded uh, animal skulls. Um, so I was just looking through all the great gilded objects in the Frick collection, which I uh, often get to see in person when I'm here, and this really stood out to me. Um, this is called To a Skylark, a painting that I did last year. This is a detail of a, of a very large panel. Um, the animal bodies, in this case birds, are once again in a state of transition, in flux and without boundaries. Um, so I do like to play between these kind of strange uh, fellowships between plant and animal and things um, that are normally separated by species or geography or time and everything kind of can come together and sort of blur fact and fiction. Um, and then here's the marvelous uh, Severo de, Ra de Ravenna's um, sea monster. There's several pieces of Severo's in the uh, Frick collection that are just marvelous. This is from 1510, this wonderful sea monster that I believe is an oil well. And um, again, my interest in the fantastical and mythological form and fancy and um, this wonderful conch that's balancing on the back of the beast. Um, and I wanted to show it up against a, um, a piece that I did that's um, these two little snails balancing themselves on the back of a morphine uh, undulating form. And this painting is titled Mollusk. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, images on the left is from a series I did of a bestiary that is titled uh, Swarm of Flock of Host. Um, it was a commissioned project from the Achenbach Foundation a few years ago, and I got the great honor to collaborate with the poet Mark Doty, who, um, and this project was uh, commissioned and then put out by Prestel in a really lovely book and then a fine edition of prints. So um, just quickly, um, the uh, the, the genre of the medieval bestiary um, not only constituted a natural history of creation, but also participated in this rich tradition of the moralizing allegory, sometimes alphabetical or encyclopedic, and blurring fact and fiction, not unlike the sea monster we just, showed, we just saw. So um, I just wanted to show you this one in particular with the lion and the pelican, and then a, another sculptural work of mine that's made with um, actual uh, uh, crustaceans, crabs that are um, painted and um, turned into the sculptural work. Uh, so the last two things I wanted to discuss, and I feel like I'm maybe running a little long, um, but um, this is a project that I did um, in 2014. It was completed, and it was first uh, made for the um, for Mass Mocha uh, in North Adams, Massachusetts, and then went to the Smithsonian's Freer Sackler Gallery for two years. And it's uh, titled Filthy Lucre, and it's a contemporary reimagining of uh, James McNeil Whistler's 1876 decorative masterpiece, Harmony in Blue and Gold, The Peacock Room. So I just became so fascinated with The Peacock Room for um, for some time, both by its sort of un, unrivaled beauty and this union of painting and architecture, um, and it has this incredible dramatic story of, of patronage and artistic ego, and certainly the two peacocks in it, um, uh, in this narrative of the room, um, are based on the relationship between Whistler and his uh, patron, um, Leyland. 
Uh, so the idea was just to reconstruct this important painterly historical room as a sumptuous ruin. Um, and to all the details that were um, in the original room, I did my own version of it, which included making um, about 150 ceramic pieces, painting all the surfaces, um, glass fixtures made, um, the, uh, uh, the ceiling, it's all, in, it's all built in modular um, pieces and occupies, I think about, a, the fl floor print is about 18 feet by uh, 10 feet roughly. It also has a very um, extraordinarily beautiful and haunting soundscape by the musical trio Betty. And so the whole, spe the whole space is very immersive and um, in, in multi-sensory in many ways. Um, and it really is also trying to hint at the parallels of sort of the excesses and inequities of the Gilded Age and relating that to our own um, economic disparities of our own time. Um, this is just a little detail from uh, one of the murals in the room that is uh, the Fighting Peacocks mural that is the artist and his patron. And uh, this is just, this again, this play of the decorative with this very kind of emotional underbelly. I guess underbelly is really literal in this one. Um, and it's here the two very elegant and fierce peacocks are literally dismembering uh, each other disemboweling each other. Um, this is a detail of the Porcelain Princess, which is a very famous painting of Whistler's in the room. And this is my version of her in her own kind of morphine mutation. Um, I wanted to show you her up against one of the most magnificent, beautiful paintings um, in the Frick collection, which is Symphony in Flesh Color and Pink. It's a portrait of Mrs. Frances Leyland um, the wife of the patron who's um, the subject of, um, of the Peacock Room. And um, so Whistler is just a whole other talk and another time for me because he's just one of the, <laughs> you know, there's so much to say about Whistler um, beyond just the Peacock Room and beyond this gorgeous painting of just dreamy, peachy, dreamy, gauzy gorgeousness. It's just, it's just his, he's so deft and so confident with the most minimum um, uh, strokes, and he's able to load that brush with so many variations and gradations of color and, um, and, and just create a certain, a different version of Sfumato, certainly. Um, and, uh, but Whistler was a very complicated character and very kind of Oscar Wilde and Oscar Wildean with his kind of biting humor and um, he was quite uh, a kind of rash character and uh, tempered character. And so hence the image before of the, the fighting peacocks with their talons out, that was certainly Whistler. Um, and the last thing to conclude with is a project that's in development right now, um, uh, going back to the emotive eye. Um, this is an image from um, uh, one of the early watercolors I did when I was in Assisi and I chose to open it up uh, for this section, but it's uh, going again to returning to the motif of the emotive eye, uh, which is a factored heavily into my work since this time in Assisi. Um, the emotive eye represents states of emotion such as sorrow, mourning, suffering, rapture, love, ecstasy. In particular, these affects are manifested through a whole sophisticated repertoire of signs and how eyes and their expressions um, are figured in historical paintings. Um, oops. Um, this is, um, if you have a chance to see this while you're here, please do, because it's just one of the most gorgeous, sumptuous paintings that's uh, in the collection, the dep deposition. is painted by the great uh, Netherlandish painter, Gerald Dav David, um, around 1500, I think. Um, and just this brilliant use of col color and, um, I, I want to talk to you so much about him, but I can't. Um, but anyway, this is such a great painting and um, with this incredible saturated color, but also, um, you know, he's one of the painters who really focus so much on the kind of human condition and really taking into account uh, details of 
of the human experience and, and vulnerability and, and various psychological and emotional states. Um, so most of his work surviving, it's very much uh, religious themes. Um, and um, he uh, was very innovative with, you know, approaching landscape and the figure all together in these kind of very, uh, very much in the same way that Bellini, um, you know, really brought uh, the two in a very, very strong way where the landscape, landscape really holds on its own and is not just the backdrop of a dramatic scene. Um, this is just a, um, a wall in my studio I wanted to share with you that is part of this current uh, developing project um, that is called the Congregation of Tears. And it's um, my second kind of large scale immersive installation that is both architectural and painterly. And it's a Byzantine inspired sanctuary and a meditation on how and why we cry. Um, the Byzantine period was the first time that artists intentionally depicted the human, human emotional states in works of art. Um, you know, the Byzantine Empire goes from like the fifth century for nearly a thousand years until the middle of the 15th century. Um, so not unlike Filthy Lucre, I'm continuing to explore the language of painting in its relationship to broader multi-sensory experiences, and this time in the form of a chapel. Um, in my project, I will take up, um, or I am uh, working on it, so I'm taking up sort of this visual communication um, between pathos, joy, pleasure, sorrow, and, um, and all by the means of the emotive eye in some way. Also here, there are a couple sketches of seraphim, which I realized just now that there's some seraphim on there. So, um, uh, so these are just some of the uh, ways in which I work where I'll, I'll come up with a lot of drawing sketches and try to get a sense of the visual vocabulary that um, I'm working with. Oops, sorry. Um, this is uh, the first round of the architectural model, which has been altered quite a bit since in, the, in terms of um, contemporizing uh, all the details of a Byzantine um, chapel. Um, so this is going to be, once again, um, a space that you walk into. It, the top, the height of it is just about 18 feet, and it's, um, it really is the size of a very small um, chapel. Um, and when you, um, when you walk inside, this is obviously the model, um, upon entering the interior space, um, the viewer will be confronted with an image-rich painterly space, a fresco-like mural on gold ground that continually wraps around all four walls, ceiling and cupola, depicting a flattened out fantastical landscape. Countless images of weeping eyes like constellations occupy these earthly and celestial realms. Wrapping around the in entirety of the space will be a painted inscription taken from a commissioned poem um, specifically for the project that uh, was just finished by Mark Doty again. Um, it's an Islamic tradition that script becomes an image and the painted poem coexists with the pictorial mural. So together text and image come together to create this complex emotional narrative on the contemplation of why and how we produce tears. And these are just some rather crude but hopefully descriptive photographs of the inside of the model. Um, and the last image I um, wanted to end with in closing is this painting called Byzantium that relates to the, um, the Chapel of Tears, or the, sorry, the Congregation of Tears. Um, I'm always asking myself in the studio, how do I paint pathos, passion, or bliss, and what figures and shapes emerge out of energies that do not necessarily belong to us but that we nonetheless experience. I have been pursuing this ineffable quest uh, my entire career as an artist, and certainly Bellini's painting here at the Frick um, really, truly put me on that course. Um, I think for all of us, there are those times when a painting comes with pleasures that allow us to have an opening into what is otherwise inaccessible, 
and to often feel deeply what is not of this world at all. So thank you for allowing me to present this work. And, uh, and now Xavier and I get to have a chat with all of you. Thanks. time, but um, we started a little bit late, so I hope you can all bear with us for a little bit longer. Um, so, so many, many things you discussed, Darren, fascinating things. I, I just want to start with the kind of chicken and egg question oh, no. about the Bellini and your interest in landscape and hermits and sort of nature and human beings. Sort of what came first? I mean, was, it, was that, were those themes that you were interested in as a young artist and then the Bellini sort of struck a chord with you? Or was it something that came out of the Bellini? Uh, I think it, it did come out of the Bellini. It really did. I mean, I still, I was just like a barely formed young artist in, in my undergraduate you know, painting studies. And uh, it's always interested, though, in work of this nature and in art history. That's what I was looking at all the time. So once I actually had this first encounter with the Bellini painting, it really did sort of solidify um, where my preoccupations of found themselves. So the painting came, I would say the painting really is where it started, truly. Um, I mean, I am, am studying, uh, you know, early Renaissance painting uh, at that time was, um, I mean, as a, you know, as a contemporary artist, that always seems to be where I, where I find myself again. I, all, all roads end up leading back to the Renaissance, so. Uh, I can't help myself. So another thing that always strikes me about your work is that, I mean, as an art historian, when, when you study the Renaissance, you always have two options, the Italian or the Northern. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as scholars tend to be Northern experts versus Italian Southern experts, you know, Bellini is one thing, Altorfer, Bosch, Dürer, Grunewald are a different thing. And somehow you're equally interested in, in, in all of them and you manage to work combining very different pictorial languages, these very different schools. H how do you feel about that? I mean, is it something that you're consciously trying to do? Is it something that you're just interested in these artists and it naturally becomes something in your work that is sort of blended in a, in a way? But it's, it's almost like opposite. So yeah. getting them to work together, and, you know, the, the St. Francis work you've opened with, the fact that St. Francis is turning into sort of out of her type tree. Um, which is so alien to, to Bellini's work in a way. Mm -hmm. H how does that work? Um, I don't know. I always think that one, one very distinctive quality between the two um, northern and southern renaissances is that the northern school, they really didn't have a lot of places to kind of get up and look at the vista. You know, it was just like they were all living and working in very, um, they're in the Danube. They're in like, they're in the Black Forest. They're in a very flat topographic land. And so much of the paintings that they did were truly these imagined landscapes. And they would also ref refer to the Southern um, painters of that time in, in Italy to see, well, what were they doing? And how high could they get up? And what could they see? And, and so, so much of that, their work had to end up becoming a sort of pastiche where they would patch together sort of fragments of landscape that was either observed or imagined to sort of create these whole images, where the Italian Renaissance just has this much more kind of observational access to, um, to create uh, an environment where um, also I think the Northern Renaissance School you know, learned so much about landscape painting from the North because they were, um, you know, the northern schools really taking the landscape in a way to where the, like, the narrative, often a biblical narrative or pastoral narrative or myth mythological narrative, is just kind of shrunk down and the landscape kind of holds this ground. And I think that was a, one way in which the northern renaissance affected the southern. But for me, I just, I'm always influenced by these, 
these two particular um, approaches in art making, particularly because as a painter, I, I'm just interested in the history of the materials and the kind of physicality of painting them and the materials that they used and how they constructed a panel. And, and so each school has its own sort of timeline and approach. And, and so I'm, I am kind of like a novice art historian in that way of just like the painter always kind of wished he was an academic maybe, you know, like <laughs> so, yeah. So when looking at the Bellini, I always feel you, you get this very immediate sense of Bellini himself going out in nature, being surrounded by nature and, and probably sketching and, and, and thinking about the landscape on the Venetian mainland and maybe even La Verna, where St. Francis was. And the same is very true of, of Dura, who did incredible watercolors and, and drawings of, of real landscapes, and Altorfer just as well, and, and Grunewald. W what is your relationship with nature? I mean, do you feel it's more filtered through artworks? Because you're talking about nature the whole time, but you're looking at nature through the eyes mm -hmm. of these other artists. Or is it something that you're interested in as well yourself? Yeah, I don't really ever like work from actual observation in nature. And I find it's more, my relationship with it is incredibly um, intimate and kind of central in my life in so many ways, but it's not, it comes into my artistic practice in a kind of peripheral way, or though it is so dominant in it, it's, it's also just more, um, I feel like it sort of um, emboldens me and informs me in my kind of whole all aspects of my life, but the, my interest in it <coughs> is also, um, uh, you know, as a kind of more of a place where I go, I go to nature for um, a different kind of experience that is not like going to e exactly directly inform what I'm painting. But, but I know it's there. I mean, I'll, I'll take a, you know, a walk in the garden and without even knowing it, I'm back in the studio and there's some little gesture or shape or form that was actually observed, but not close enough to where I would think I could actually rep, you know, represent it. Well, you, you started by talking about saints and hermits, and I think one of the incredible things about the Bellini is that, in a way, it's an essay about the relationship between man and nature, and how this single individual sits within nature, and how we all in a way or another, sit or don't sit within, within the natural world that surrounds us. Um, how, I mean, I, I, I was struck, I mean, I've known your work now for a long time, but I was struck by your talk about how much of it is about single contemplation. So your, your works are usually about single figures within, within nature, but also your, your installations in many ways kind of encourage a contemplative experience, which is usually more of a solitary one than a, than a group one, let's say. Yeah. And even though Filthy Lucre, you know, you could have more than one person in the space, it somehow having experienced that, you felt you were in there by yourself, even though there were physically other people. And I suspect the chapel will be a similar concept. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think of all your works as sort of a solitary experience for you and to be experienced that way by other people? or? Or is that just something that happens naturally? Yeah, no, I do. I, I do think about the, um, the kind of, uh, I mean, for me, the actual making of the work is a very devotional practice. You know, I feel like I'm, you know, just when I go into the studio, I really feel like I'm going into, um, you know, a, um, you know, it's a sacred space and it's a place where, you know, um, where there is a kind of, um, you know, you're in the muck of it and it's difficult and messy and, but most of the time you're alone in it. And so um, I, I find that once, you know, any work of art that I come to, it's so seldom ever really a shared experience, even though I might be with other, another person or people seeing a work of art, but it is, it's, um, you know, the way in which we are changed in a very individual and personal way by, um, by the encounter of, of, uh, of a painting. And so for me, or not just a painting, but any, any, uh, any expression, any artistic expression. So I feel like it's a very 
a solitary experience. And, and I do set out to make work that is in some way um, sort of demands attention that is, um, that is very much about the individual experience. Great, so um, I know we're running out of time, so um, I was wondering if there are any questions from the public, for Darren, for, for both of us. Um, we probably have time for a couple of questions, but if anyone has any burning, there, there's a microphone that will be coming your way. I noticed you use a lot of different mediums in your work, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit behind choosing to do a work on paper versus an oil versus um, the sections that mimic the older styles. How do you go about selecting that? Um, yeah, they're all, it's all happening sort of t simultaneously. Like I work very freely between um, the oil painting, which is, has its own kind of demands and the watercolor as well, which is much more immediate, but also much less forgiving. And so I like the play of you know, having, uh, and, and it also changes around scale too, because with watercolors, I can kind of play out things in a much smaller scale and I can do more and explore things where oil painting is just so much more physically demanding and allows for a different uh, way of scale as do these larger projects, because I, I really um, I'm so interested in the way that painting uh, can be experienced in a you know in a full environment, and you just think like that's sort of originally how works of art were experienced. They were very much about the the space, and they related to the architecture, and they were often in devotional spaces or, or chapels or places of worship, and so, um, and so I, I'm always thinking about like the history of oil painting still really does relate to, to architecture in a certain way. Oh no, Twain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I was just curious about what degree of this deals with pure spirituality, uh, aesthetic decisions and your own position as an artist, you know, performing. But how much, 10%, is, is there any spiritual input? Is there any kind of metaphysical uh, portion of yourself involved besides being an artist? But I mean, is there just a pure spirituality? Is there any, because they're very, they're very religious. Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of the subject matter can be, I mean, it's, it, it references sort of religious subject matter, but I am so not a religious person, but I'm, as a person who's interested in art and art history, you have to find a way to engage in the, these narratives and, um, and have an understanding of the uh, impact and effect on um, religious subject matter in, in art history. Um, so for me, it is a, the practice of, of coming to the easel or to paint is a, um, it is about um, it is about disembodiment again. You know, it is about this way of how do I how do I get out of the way? How do I stay present and conscience conscious and be able to um, you know explore these ideas that come? Some of them are very studied. Some of them are very about um, uh, a very nuanced about just the the matter of chance and the the idea of chance as well as things that are um, very intentional. And so it, for me, I have to sort of do this thing and I think it's very typical for most artists is that you kind of hover between getting out of your own way and then just staying in this kind of state of, um, of heightened awareness, you know. And maybe that heightened awareness is a spiritual state, I don't know. One, one last question. Um, if you could just wait for the microphone. How would you describe the process of your relationship with The question was how would I characterize um, uh, my relationship to surrealism? And yes, very, very much there. Um, and uh, that, that has always factored in into where there is um, 
I mean, sur surrealism comes as a particular art movement, as a, you know, as a 20th century art movement, but, um, but if you're looking through the lens of the kind of real and unreal, and, um, and again, these particular uh, uh, depictions of, of, of a world that is um, seemingly impossible, and yet there is this kind of logic to it, and I mean, those, those themes of the surrealists, or you know, all the surrealists are looking back um, even earlier at this, at this similar you know, work because it's, there is incredible um, surrealism found in, in great Renaissance paintings. You know, it's like, so yes, um, very much so. Well, so thank you everyone. Um, thank you, Darren, for this very thought-provoking talk. Thank you. And I would invite you all to wander around the Frick and go and look at St. Francis again. It might be difficult to have a solitary experience with him today, <laughs> but uh, try and imagine that. Um, we and also have a little exhibition on Van Eyck, which also is a rather contemplative experience about charter house and silence and living in monastic institutions. So it seems to be our hermit theme for the time being. Um, and then go drink a Bellini tonight. Exactly. Today too. A Bellini in honor of Bellini. So thank you very much. <laughs>